Shalom tribe, this is Jack Sear at Nomadic Wonders and Temple Health and today we have a special video for you. We are going to take a tour walk with Joe Hollis from Mountain Gardens. Um, it is located in North Carolina, so if you are in North Carolina, it's not too far from Black Mountain. Um, he has created an amazing biome, an amazing ecosystem up in his property where he carries a lot of different types of unique and unique herbs from Asia, from America, from so he combines the, the Asian and the Western medicine together um, and he really goes deep into um, the different properties of different plants. Now, so this is part one, this is the intro. He's gonna go over generalized um, information about what the walk is, but I encourage you to go ahead and take a tour um, if you are in North Carolina, all right? Well, I hope you enjoyed part one, and then I'll put snippets of part two, part three, um, and just general different herbs that I captured during my tour so that you can enjoy and you can learn. All right, thank you so much for watching this video. If you like it, like and subscribe. And um, yeah, enjoy, shalom. At that time it was all woods and never been farmed uh, because it was too rocky. <clears throat> the whole middle of the garden, which is the main part of, of the gardens is uh, about 80% rocks. And that's because of just geological history. Uh, you can see this slope goes down, that slope goes down, and of course the middle is kind of flat, and that's because the middle is all filled up with rocks that have come down over the course of geological time, landslides, whatever. So actually my water comes out of the National Forest up there, and it goes underground and comes out across the road. <laughs> it's my neighbor's spring. This is unfortunate for me, um, but it's because it's been buried by all these landslides and whatever. So, uh, this is an interesting piece of property. It involves, uh, it was only 2.8 acres is what I originally purchased. And it involves four different, at least, plant communities, depending on how you want to count. So down in the center is what's called Cove Hardwoods. And that's the, uh, the most rich uh, environment, the most diverse uh, ecosystems in uh, the United States. Uh, and one of the most diverse in the world. It's almost like you might call it a temperate rainforest in terms of diversity. There are at least a dozen potential canopy tree species. Most plant communities have only one. And this is this plant community is where all of the famous, uh, almost all of the famous Southern Appalachian medicinal herbs, Southern Appalachian wild foods, Southern Appalachian wild flowers, most of them come from this plant community. And then as you go out in concentric rings, so you're going from the most moist area, which is going to be down in the valley next to the uh, water and where lots of leaf mold is piled up and enriched the soil. As you go up the sides, you get to uh, hemlocks. And so this whole, my garden was in, ringed by hemlocks. And I kind of designed the whole garden based on these hemlocks. And I don't know how much you're all are aware, but all the hemlocks have died because of uh, an insect that came in. So we, standing right here, there would have been no herbs. This would have been just hemlock trees. Mm -hmm. Under evergreens, you get no herbs. Like, go into a pine forest. How many herbs do you see? <laughs> you know, almost nothing. Uh, because of that evergreen shade. So this all was hemlocks right here. There's a giant stump right there. Under that, all the green, that's a stump of a hemlock tree. This was a hemlock grove. Uh, they're all gone now. Uh, and that's, we were just talking about it. Uh, for the PBS thing that's has a lot to do with climate change because the insects that killed all the hemlocks are would not have been able to live here probably 20 years ago when it used to go to 10 below zero it hasn't gone to down to zero in at least 10 years it used to go typically to 10 below sometimes years 15 below so that's climate change in action um, so everything is <laughs> kind of shifting around. But then, <clears throat> to carry on with what I was saying, after the hemlocks, then it goes to white oak, 
plant community, then it goes up to red oaks and hickories, which is what we have here up on the ridges. And the flora, everything changes. So there's different shrubs, different herbs, all go with, you know, the different uh, habitats. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we walk along. But mainly we just got a fairly short plant walk this morning. I just, uh, through, uh, yesterday I did a four hour one on medicinal herbs. Today is just two hours on walking around and looking at whatever catches our eye. Uh, and if I walk past things that I don't say anything about, but you wonder what they are, feel free to ask. And I'll just enlarge on that. There's, I think this is the largest collection of medicinal herbs and uh, wild foods, perennial vegetables in at least the eastern half of the United States. So there's a lot to look at. And we ain't going to see it all in two hours. You're welcome to come back anytime. I teach other workshops and, uh, and we're open to the public. You can come up anytime and walk around. Like you might want to come back in, in a couple of weeks and see this in bloom. This is like gorgeous big Turks cap lilies uh, with a giant orange, you know, recurved petals and so on. These happen to be Chinese species. Bai He is the Chinese name, and it's an important medicinal herb for the respiratory system. Uh, in addition to being a really beautiful wildflower, this is a different species down here. Also Bai He, but a different species of lily. It's getting ready mm -hmm. to bloom. Mm -hmm. So we grow a lot of medicinal herbs, and I have put a lot of energy into the connection between East Asia and Eastern North America. We have a very similar bioclimate in the first place, and secondarily, we have uh, the plants are related. So botanists have been talking for hundreds of years about the connection between the flora of Eastern North America and the flora of East Asia. A really uh, obvious example would be ginseng. You got ginseng in East Asia, you got ginseng in Eastern North America, and there's no ginseng anywhere else in the world. Uh, and that has to do with the history of the glaciers and lots of other stuff that I won't go into, but it's been a really interesting uh, aspect of what I'm doing. So here's Solomon Seal, a really excellent, uh, it's, a, it's a great wild food and it's medicinal plant. These are probably Chinese Solomon Seals. We have three species of Child Solomon seal in America, but the Chinese have like 52 species of Solomon seal. So we use it as a wild food and as a uh, medicinal herb. In Western herbalism, it's mainly, mainly thought to be good for the bones. Uh, if you dig up the roots, they look like bones. That's called doctrine of signatures, the idea that each plant somehow contains a clue that'll tell you what it's good for. And that's kind of almost universal around the world that people think that way. I mean, what else are you gonna do if you're sick? If you wanna look for an herb to help you out, how are you gonna like what? You know, so you think, well, maybe there's some clue. So if it's got red flowers, maybe it's good for my blood. Right? If it's got a root that looks like a bone, maybe it's good for my bones. If it grows in a swamp, maybe it's good for rheumatism, etc. That's, that's just a, a natural human kind of way to think about things. Uh, but in China, uh, Solomon Seal is regarded as a longevity herb, uh, a tonic herb for, for uh, longevity and specifically for the respiratory system. So that's very interesting to grow these things side by side. They're very closely related. They look a lot like each other, but the Chinese found this use for them and we found this use for them. Who's right? Well, we're both right, probably. It's probably good for both of these things. Anyway, so we got we could stand right here for the next two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I could just tell you about <coughs> all these wonderful plants. But we do want to walk around the garden and show it off a little bit. This is a good one up here I'd like to point out. This is tea, uh, the kind of tea you, that you drink. So oh. this is uh, green tea or black tea or oolong tea. It doesn't matter. It all comes from the same plant and it all has to do with how it's uh, handled post-harvest. 
So if you want to make green tea, you just pick these little tiny bitty leaves. And these are already a little bit too big. Uh, Chinese would like to pick them when they're tiny, but the smaller they are, the better they are uh, from their perspective. And from yours, if you taste it, uh, they taste really sweet when they're teeny tiny. And as they get bigger, they start to get a little bit more bitterness in them. <coughs> and then after you harvest, if you uh, heat it up, toast it, ferment, pile it up and let it ferment, then it turns more into black tea. So tea is a great plant everywhere around the world where there's mountains, people grow tea commercially. There's not much tea grown in America, but it's coming. It's starting to be a thing. <coughs> There'll be more and more uh, plantations of tea, but especially up here in the mountains. So I try to uh, specialize in plants for my bioregion, you know, things that can be grown specifically in the mountains for people that are interested in, you know, some kind of commercial crop or whatever. Oh, what else can I look at here? So this is an interesting one. Arycophragmus violaceus. And that'll be on the quiz. I want you to all to remember, <laughs> this is Arycophragmus violaceus. <laughs> We call it, uh, well, for a while we called it violet mustard, but now we call it Mongolian mustard. This is a plant I introduced. <coughs> and it comes from uh, Mongolia and China. This is highest in protein of any uh, plant in the cabbage family, which is a big cab. That's a big family. That includes turnips and radishes and broccoli and cauliflower and kohlrabi, oh, no, no, no. that's all in this family, but this has more protein than any of those, and they taste pretty good. You're welcome to, uh, it's scattered all around, you're welcome to uh, pick a flower and taste it. They're quite tasty, and the leaves taste a lot like something called arugula, mm. or roquette. It's a self-sowing annual, it's what's called a winter annual, so there are uh, <coughs> Sorry, I picked up a little cough here. Uh, leaves taste quite good, too. So this, uh, it's what's called a winter annual. Which is, so most annuals germinate in the spring, grow all summer, flower in the autumn, make seeds, die. Winter annuals germinate in the autumn and grow all winter <coughs> and come around... Uh, flower in the spring and make seeds and then die. So this is actually what you might call a self-sowing cover crop, uh, which is nice. You know, it's something there in the winter. So that's something that we introduced. I don't think anybody <coughs> in America is growing it except me and the people I've given it to. <laughs> um, it's available if we sell seeds of it. <coughs> I don't know where this is. Sorry, I, I didn't have a cough a half an hour ago. Something caught in my throat. What else can we look at here? There's so much good stuff. The Sullivan Seal, this is a really nice oriental jack in the pulpit. You can see the flowers down there. <coughs> you can see the resemblance to jack in the pulpit. That's uh, Those are used medicinally uh, for cough. <laughs> uh, among other things, they all have to be processed. The entire family of, of uh, aeroids is, uh, has some toxicity. So the way the Chinese have learned to process these is detoxifying them with ginger juice or lime. <clears throat> the way the American Indians did it, they used to eat Solomon, uh, Jack of the Pulpit roots, they were called Indian turnips. <clears throat> they would eat them and they'd bake them in pits for a long time and that detoxifies them. There are various ways to detoxify these things. So <clears throat> all this business about processing herbs is quite fascinating. Like potatoes. Potatoes are really pretty poisonous. But the mm -hmm. Peruvians, you know, or Ecuadorians, whoever, figured out all kinds of, by breeding, by selective breeding, and then by processing, they figured out how to make them into a really, really important edible root. Uh, but that's all, you know, human effort. <clears throat> that's starting from a plant that was basically poisonous. 
And even now, green, uh, the green parts of potatoes, as, as I think everybody mm -hmm. knows, are not good to eat at all. Let's walk around and look at, so I want to keep moving around to, to show you different parts of the garden. <laughs> I'm going to come around this way. Can we go first? <clears throat> Well, here's an interesting one. This is uh, Epimedium uh, Yinyanghuo, or uh, horny goat weed. And it's a yang tonic in Chinese medicine. I've gotten quite involved with Chinese medicine because I grow a lot of Chinese herbs. It's a yang tonic for the kidneys. The kidneys are the organ that's associated with reproductive energy. So... So this has got a bit of a reputation in America as an aphrodisiac. Uh, you can buy it in what I call the Chinese herb pharmacy section of your local truck stop, <laughs> where they have ginseng and ephedra and other things, herbs that have come to America. Uh, so it boosts sexual energy, but it's also in China primarily used by menopausal women rather than horny old men. <laughs> I use my horny old men as well. The Chinese uh, and thousands of years of history of the greatest brains in China devoting their lives to keeping the emperor sexually active. You know, so they put a lot of energy into all this longevity stuff. Most of these tonic herbs are thought of as longevity herbs, primarily. And uh, the Chinese have put a lot of energy into it. This is a beautiful ground cover. Really nice flowers. You can check them out. Uh, so it's grown as an ornamental quite a bit, but the medicinal part is the leaves, <clears throat> and they're used as a yang tan. Yin yang huo, it means horny goat weed, and the story is that this shepherd <clears throat> is noticing that this one male goat is like very sexually active, and every time he would copulate, he would run off and eat this herb, and then he'd come back and copulate it. <laughs> Like, whoa, what's going on here? <laughs> so that's how this herb <laughs> was discovered. Mm, probably not true, but they have lots of fun stories like that. Help them remember the uses of the plants. And what do we got here? This is now the second <clears throat> most valuable plant in the woods around here. This is called uh, false unicorn root as a medicinal herb. And we'll see it here and there around the garden. I'm putting a lot of energy into growing this. It's used for women's fertility and preventing miscarriage and things like that. It's, uh, there's not a lot of scientific validation for this. And, and, and that's true of many other medicinal herbs because there's no money in it. You know, so nobody's going to put money into researching something that they can't patent and make a lot of money off of unfortunately. But this is quite an interesting plant. It's in the lily family. It's, uh, there's male or females. These are both females. Only the females make seeds, of course. And most herb companies do not sell this, even though there's a huge demand for it. And the reason they don't sell it is because all of it is stolen out of the wild, you might say. Uh, there's no <coughs> cultivation of this going on. It's just all wild crafted and it's endangered everywhere uh, because it's gotten up to $80 a pound. So so my effort is primarily to to grow more of it for seed, to get seed onto the market. There's very, very little seed. I mean, how are we going to cultivate it if we don't have seed, right? So that's what I'm trying to do. I've got a lot of little side projects going on. That's one of them. Is this a native or one yes, of the Asian native? native? Okay. Yep, Camelarium ludium. Uh, as a wildflower, it's called fairy wand, and it's fairly showy, which is unfortunate because that means it's going to get over harvested. Ginseng, you got to get right on top of it to see what it is. This thing you can see from a hundred feet away in the woods. You'll see some as you walk along. The big, rather showy plumes. So, somebody's got some land, some woodland, and want to open for something to grow. <laughs> that might be one to think about. 
So as I said, if you see anything that you want to know about, uh, feel free to ask. I'll just talk about the few things that uh, catch my eye. These are hospitals. Did you donate them? Pardon me? Did you donate your hospital? The deer don't eat your hostas. That's because I don't have any deer. Oh. Uh, <laughs> thank God. Yes, the, the first thing the deer eat. Uh, but what nobody in America knows is it's also something that people can eat. Yes. In Japan, they have a word that says sansai. That means wild mountain vegetables. And these are all like things that people really like to eat in the springtime. Because they taste good, because they're really nourishing, because whatever, it's kind of just a celebration of spring is to eat these things in America. Ramps is one of them. <clears throat> or bamboo shoots, or uh, fiddlehead ferns. And there's like it's like 50 different sansais in Japan, and almost every one of them has a relative in America. Except hostas. There are no <coughs> hostas in America. So this is a very popular sansai. It's a spring vegetable. Almost nobody in America except the deer know that this was edible. <laughs> and the time you eat them is when they first come up in the spring, all the leaves are curled up in little tubes. I think it's a little too late for me to show you an example of that. I've already gone past. You can almost see it here. They come up curled up in little tubes, and that's when you eat them. So with a lot of these spring wild foods, there's a very short window. They're too small, and then they're just right, and then they're too big. Uh, as soon as they open up, by and large, they start to get tough. <clears throat> and the sugars, as they come out of the ground, they got a lot of sugar in them. And when they hit the air, uh, it starts to convert into starch. Mm. Same with bamboo shoots, for instance. In Japan, they walk around <clears throat> barefoot in the groves to find the bamboo shoots before they come up. Because as soon as they hit the air, they're gonna, the flavor is going to deteriorate. So when we harvest bamboo shoots, we look for the smallest little ones. But even better is if you can find them before they even came up. That's going to be the best. There's a very high-end restaurant in Japan, and they fly people into the bamboo grove. We're talking about millionaires, you know, <laughs> and afford this kind of stuff. They fly them into the middle of the bamboo grove, and they set up this huge banquet, and they dig them up and roast them right on the spot. And it's like as good as you can get, you know, and that's worth a million dollars to some people to eat these little teeny tiny bamboo shoots. Bamboo shoots are really, really excellent for uh, wild well, food plant. Let's see what else you can see as we walk along. So I want to kind of keep moving because I want to basically try and get you around the whole garden as possible in two hours. Yeah, let's just go along this way for a while. This one here is interesting. This is Siberian ginseng, also called Eleutherococcus centicosis. We'll see some bigger ones as we go along, probably. That's this plant. So it's a, a woody plant in the ginseng family. I grow everything I can find in the ginseng family. His family is full of what's called adaptogens. So adaptogens are plants that help the body adapt to stress. See, if some of you would move along a little bit, then other people would come up. And in fact, the term adaptogen was invented. I know you want to film to go past you. The Russians did a whole lot of research <clears throat> back in the 1950s or 60s for the purpose of winning more gold medals at the Olympics. That's what they really wanted to do. And this was their best uh, plant. So they give this plant to their Olympic athletes, they give it to their cosmonauts, they give it to everybody with a high stress occupation. Because of all this research they did, uh, about plants that help the body adapt to stress. So that's adaptogens. That's a new word. That word was coined because they figured out that this plant was doing something, but they needed a word for what it was doing. So back in the 50s or 60s, the entire medical establishment 
insisted that ginseng did nothing. It was just a myth, it was just folklore. It didn't do anything at all until this Bulgarian researcher came up with this rat swimming test. And to do the rat swimming test, what you need is some water and a rat and a stopwatch. And so you give the rats, you throw the rat in there, you see how long it can swim. And then you give the rat some Siberian ginseng or other adapter, it can swim twice as long. So then you've proved that it actually does something, right? Up until then, there was no test that proved that ginseng or any of them did anything. So I have a somewhat of a specialty with adaptogens because these are bi uh, herbs that help you to be more healthy. I mean, there's plenty of herbs you can take when you're sick, but the best thing, obviously, is to take herbs so that you don't get sick. And that's adaptogens. So that's somewhat of a specialty of my gardening. This is wasabi here, which everybody presumably has heard of. And you can, welcome to taste it. You can tear off a little piece and pass it around. <laughs> wasabi, uh, we don't get much wasabi in America. What we get is horseradish with green food coloring. Just pass it down the line. It's a rare plant. It grows next to streams in Japan. It likes a lot of water. Uh, I have it here next to my path where I can keep it watered, but the best of it grows next to the stream. And this is actually a medicinal herb. It's for food poisoning. It's the purpose of this herb, especially uh, seafood poisoning, you know, which is a problem. Lots of people have trouble with seafood of different kinds, especially if you're eating it raw, <laughs> which is what, what we do. So the reason this is on your sushi is because it uh, can potentially counteract uh, ill effects from eating the seafood. And then the other thing you get with your seafood is ginger. That's a very important anti-nausea herb. If you ever have a problem with nausea, some raw ginger will like clear it out fast. And then the ginger is colored pink with yet a third herb called perilla or bee steak plant, which is used as a food coloring, but it's also an anti-nausea herb. So we think of that as just really a nice food combination. You know, buy this sushi, they give you this little wad of wasabi, which really isn't wasabi, it's probably horseradish, uh, but it has the same flavor. So we think of that as just flavoring, but it all has med a medicinal explanation to it. What's that? Le what's that um, plant next to the wasabi with the that this? one? Yeah, that's bloodroot. Oh, and it's a major uh, medicinal herb in North America. These flower very, very early in the spring. They finished flowering quite a while ago. These are the seed pods down here. These little things, and they're going to pop out traditionally. I'm interested to see how it goes this year. It's always been Memorial Day when mm -hmm. those things pop open. And you can't open them any sooner. The seed's not ready until it pops open. And then when it pops open, ants come and carry it away mm -hmm. and plant it because there's a little part attached to the seed called an arrow that the ants like to eat. Well, if the ants eat that, the germination is about 90%. If the ants don't eat that, the germination is about 20%. So it's totally tied into the relationship with these ants. Here's bloodroot. It's uh, it's got a bright red root. If you break it, it actually bleeds. It was used as a food color, uh, not a food coloring really, but a like a paint, you know, uh, cosmetic, whatever. Indians use it a lot of different ways. The interesting thing about <laughs> we're never going to get anywhere if I keep talking. <laughs> This stuff is all flying out of the woods and going to Europe because in Europe they're smart enough that they don't allow antibiotics to be put in cattle feed anymore. So antibiotics, in case you don't know, are running out. Uh, there are more and more diseases that are immune to every known antibiotic. It's a huge problem. Uh, and the reason it's of such a big problem is that we have saturated our environment with antibiotics so all these disease organisms are developing resistance. 
and we can't invent any more antibiotics. We're at the end of the line. Uh, so at least in Europe, they've gotten smart enough that they don't put antibiotics into all cattle feed. So why do they put antibiotics into all cattle feed? Not because they're getting worried about the cattle getting sick from standing around and knee deep in shit all day. It's because they gain more weight. Mm -hmm. If you put antibiotics into their food, for every pound of feed you get them, you, they gain more weight. Uh, so it's strictly an economic thing. Anyway, our, our sanguinary is just flying out of the woods and it'll keep flying out of the woods until the price goes up to the point where they start using other plants that also have sanguinarine in them. Sang is, the genus of this is sanguinaria and the compound in it is called sanguinarine. In a lot of cases, you know, these chemical compounds are named after the plant in which they were discovered in the first place. There are other <laughs> plants that have sanguinarine, and we'll see the, some of them as we walk around, if we have time. Oh, we're going up. Yep. Let's go this way for a while. Woo. Lots of nice trilliums in here. That's a typical plant of these rich coves. Oh, uh, so these are ramps. Here and here and here. These are all ramps. And that's become a rather famous wild food. The gourmet restaurants just got on for ramps in about the past 10 or 15 years. Ramps. And they're like, they all want to have it now. It's, so it's very seasonal. This is what's called a spring ephemeral. They pop up first thing in the spring, like in March. And then as soon as the trees leaf out, they disappear. That's ephemeral. So they're really only out of the ground for about two months out of the whole year. Which is why it takes seven years for a ramp or a trillium to get the flowering size from seed because it's just only, <laughs> only photosynthesizing for a couple of months. What part do you eat? What part do you eat of the ramp? Well, you eat the whole thing. Okay. Uh, around here, people tend to dig it up and just eat the little bulb. It's kind of like a scallion and discard the top. What the American Indians did is eat the top and leave the root in the ground. So, Smart. which 